You are watching Profunda TV with host Phyllis Haynes. I am so delighted to welcome Dr. Anita Sanchez. She is a transformational leadership and corporate consultant. She shares the wisdom of the elders and their message of unbreakable connection in her new book, The Four Sacred Gifts. Welcome. It's lovely to have you. I'm going to call you Anita because I know you, but you are Dr. Anita Sanchez. It's, Anita is wonderful. It's Thank great you. to have you here. Now, Anita, I know you well, but I think people would love to know about your heritage, about your background. Yes, I'm very proud of my background. I am Aztec tribe. I actually have Aztec Indian on both sides of my family, my mother and father's side, and I'm Mexican-American. And so it is with that calling that, I, I call it blood memory, but it's with that whole memory and being taught by my parents and my grandparents of how to live in right relationship with the earth and each other that called me to really in part write this book. What are the four sacred gifts? Yes, the four sacred gifts are four gifts that elders, 27 elders from around the world put in a hoop and spirit told them these four gifts are what all humankind needs in order to bring back harmony and balance. So the four gifts are the first, the power to forgive the unforgivable. The second gift is the power of unity. The third gift is the power of healing. And the fourth gift is the power of hope in action. These four gifts, if we use these gifts on a regular basis, there are thousands of gifts, but if we use these four gifts, spirit told these elders from the various traditions around the world, that we will remember how to be in right relationship, in harmony and connection with ourselves, other people, the earth and all beings. Well, uh, let's, well take, let's take your story. What brought you to this gathering of elders? What was your interest in this? Actually, I was at a point in my life that I was really losing hope. I'm a consultant to corporate executives, diversity and inclusion. I didn't feel like women or people of color, um, gay people, others were rising up. So I did my volunteer work. And at this volunteer gathering back in the mid 90s, this hoop was there and it was going to be presented to us and the story of these gifts. And so as I was there at first, just like a chicken with her head cut off, trying to figure out what am I supposed to be doing? I'm, not losing hope, not wanting to do this anymore, having my PhD, but like, what am I supposed to do? All of a sudden, an elder shares the story of these 27 coming together and putting in the gifts. And as each gift came in, it made sense to me. And I realized that my quest for more information, more knowledge, more, 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 was totally out of alignment with what my heart and my mind really yearned for, which was wisdom. The wisdom to be in right relationship with myself and others. And the elders meeting, where did that elders meeting take place? The elders meeting took place in 1994 at Turtle Mountain Chippewa, which is down in the New Mexico, Colorado area. And the call came from 27 elders came from around the world. And for that whole weekend, they didn't, you know, there was no arguing, there was no fighting, there was no disagreement. They prayed and chanted and danced. You are watching Profunda TV with host Phyllis Haynes. The smell of sage and sweet grass drew me into the conference room. I became fully present for the first time in months. I saw a hoop with 100 eagle feathers hanging in the center of the room. It symbolized a prophecy from over a hundred years ago about a time when the elders from different directions came to pray and sing together. Remember, grandmother and grandfather make no mistakes. We each have a role to play. We are all part of one mother, one earth. We have been living in a time of a great winter 
and now we must prepare for the spring. There was silence. Then he began naming the four gifts for all humanity to help prepare ourselves and our communities. From the North, the power to forgive the unforgivable. From the West, the power of unity. From the East, the gift of healing. From the South, the gift of hope. And the gifts, Spirit said, was to help all humanity, indigenous and non-indigenous, know how to be in harmony and balance with themselves, other human beings, nature, and the earth. Well, that's something that we can learn, particularly from in indigenous Americans. And I'm grateful that you brought this book to us, but in reading it, you talk about your own personal story and the, the brilliance of your mother who had this wisdom about uh, valuing people and seeing people as individuals. Talk about your life a bit and, and yes. your family. Yes, my mother was quite amazing. She, she had a seventh grade education, but she was more brilliant than most people I've ever met. She's just incredible. But when I was 13, um, my, I had a terrible experience that most people don't have, which was my father was murdered. And the murder was race-based. And so what, he shoveled coal for a living. And after work, he would often go and have a beer. And one day, back in 1967, he went and had a beer. But he didn't know earlier that day, a white man and a black man were in there fighting. While he sat there, the white man returned and only saw the profile of my father, who was very dark complected, and fired two bullets and killed him on the spot. Needless to say, I was 13 at the time. We're aged nine to 18, with six children. And that was horrible enough to have all of that going on. But actually what happened a week later was more profound in my life that required me to use these gifts that the elders brought. A week later, the wife and the son of the man who murdered my father came to the door. And I was with my mom. And the woman just said who she was and said, I had to talk to you, Mrs. Such. I had to tell you, my husband would never have killed your husband if he knew he was Mexican and Native American. He thought he was black. And she went on to say horrible things about black people. Now, my mom was a pretty solid, short little woman. And that's the first time I ever saw her shaking. And I remember her all of a sudden saying, stop. You don't even know what you're saying. You don't even know what you're teaching your son. But I want you to know that I'm going to try really hard to pray for your soul, but you get off my porch. And that night, and I think this is probably what you read in the book, that still moves me, I think, of my mom. She gathered us six kids, and she said, because at that point we already knew about this woman and everything that was said. She says, I want you to know something. A white man murdered your father, not the white race. And then she opened the newspaper, and my father is lying there in a picture with a, in a pool of blood. And back then in Kansas City in the Star, if a person of color was murdered or anything violent, it would all be splashed all over the paper. But if it happened to a white person, it would not. And my mom said, now this, she never talked about race, this is racism. This we have to stop because everybody is due respect. Let me interrupt you and just clarify. In other words, you're saying that when a person of color was murdered or something horrible happened, the newspapers would show the bodies Yes. But if a person who was Caucasian had was murdered, they would not show the bodies. Yeah. So if there's that, any violence, they would not show that. Right. And this was a yes. form of disrespect. Yes. And your mother was wise enough to teach you this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so she did from those beginnings and also from a beginning of having uh, endured sexual abuse for nine years of my early years from age four to 13. It, it's not a surprise that I went into the field of work that I did, that I was eager to get my PhD, eager to go out and be respected, to go into all different kinds of systems, organizations, work with people, to end needless suffering. 
to bring people together to really be in love with each other, to want their gifts, regardless of what color, what gender, what orientation, whatever, that we, we are all connected. And that comes from the indigenous part of me too, that indigenous wisdom worldview is that we are all connected, we're all one, you know? And now we have science, of course, reinforcing that from the biological microorganisms to much to the macro system, they're seeing our interconnection. But these first scientists, these wisdom keepers, all over the world, they are, that is part of the wisdom that we so need today. Well, I, you know, if your mother was sitting here, I'd have to tell her how smart she is because she says something else in your book that just took my breath away. First of all, let's go over this first point. To forgive the unforgivable. It's easy to write that phrase. It's easy to say that phrase. But to actually forgive the unforgivable, your mother gives you an example. You ask her, you know, should you, how can you not forgive the taking of our land, the killing of our people, as you talk about indigenous Americans? And she says, that's, or maybe it's the elder. I'm sorry, maybe I'm saying it's What's your mother. Elder? The elder says, that's not the worst thing. Can you tell this story? I, I yeah. put this on your mother, but actually I realize now it's the elder telling you this. Yes, but they're all connected, wisdom keepers. Yes, yeah, so when I did was in the presence of the hoot being presented in 95, volunteering my time, and I was there and heard about the gifts. All sorts of things began changing me that I knew that I was called to use these gifts and to share them out to everyone. And I went in, one of my elders there, oh, Henrietta Mann, she's an amazing woman. I went to her and another elder and I said, you know, I know I'm not an elder, because there's something else I can tell. And she smiled and looked at me and she said, Anita, you think that the worst thing that happened to people, to our people, was to be murder murdered, to have our land taken, you know, on and on, our sacred bases just demolished, not allowed to practice our belief systems, but you're wrong. The worst thing that can happen to our people, to any people, is to lose hope. And that's what you were doing. You were losing hope and you can't do that because you are seeing something that other people don't see. And we need you, the earth is calling for you to be able to show us how to love each other, how to work together, dance together across all of our differences, the four direction. And that when she said that too, it was just a, another reinforcement that we are all meant to be here, regardless of our beginnings, regardless of what's happening right now, how challenging or tough, every one of us is needed. And I'm so grateful to her for sharing that and to know that, yes, I was losing hope and I can't do that. No. <laughs> that's, that's just amazing. Um, you also talk about another elder in the book uh, that you had a conversation with. But I'm just still stuck on this point of forgiving the unforgivable. I mean, how do you do that? Yeah. Well, that really starts a lot with about yourself. So we are part of everything. We're part of the stars, we're part of the earth, we're part of each other. And when we begin, even in the deepest pain, and I had a lot of pain, I had my armor, I called it, my, my shield of protection so nothing could hurt me because I wasn't going to be hurt again. Not by murder of my father to have somebody lost that way or all the sexual abuse I endured or poverty, whatever, it's no more. But what I found with this armor up is that it was good at keeping out the bad stuff, but this armor couldn't tell about the good stuff. And so being in unity, which is one of the gifts with other people who see you, I began taking down the armor. But as I began doing that and taking in what other people were seeing of my goodness, my sacredness, my ability to lead all the wonderful gifts that I come with, what really came true for me was an opening up to love myself, to really care about myself. So what finally pulled me through to forgive the unforgivable was my desire to love myself fully and the path was really freedom. 
So someone could say, you know, for hundreds of years, your people have been destroyed and it continues the, the indignities and the taking or the murder still keep happening of men and women of color and, and all of that. But what drew me was the desire to be free, to be whole, to truly love myself. And as long as I was holding on to the pain of the hurts and mistreatments, the big ones and, and the ones that individual the little ones that happen on a daily basis, then I'm not free. I'm using that energy holding that. But once I let go of that, I will tell you, it was like losing 80 pounds, but far more than that. It was being able to see and sense with clarity what was happening because it's never forgetting. So some people think, oh, forgive me, I forget. You want me to? Forgiveness does not mean forgetting what happened before. Forgiveness does not mean that you're disloyal to yourself or to your own group of people. Forgiveness does not mean that you don't seek justice. Forgiveness means that you free yourself from the chains of that so that you can use your energy for now. So I'm one of the biggest advocates and champions for justice, for peace, for unity, for all of those gifts. But I can do it out of here and now and be present to what is, understanding what occurred, but putting my energy to where I want to go. That is life-giving. That is worth it to anyone who is watching and listening to you and our, this program of yours is so magnificent that it belongs to all of us, this gift of the power to forgive the unforgivable. Freedom is right there for you. That is the best explanation of that sense of self and self-love, how empowering that can be to free oneself. Thank you for that, Anita. Now, you bring this work that you do not only to people around you, but to corporations, to institutions. How is it received? And how are you received? Well, sometimes at first, I'm received as a little bit Hmm. A PhD, a Native American, a Mexican American, and and back then when I started, of course, I've been in business for 44 years, so I was pretty young. But now it's more open. There is some shifting that is happening. Not nearly as fast, of course. I still want everything faster, but there is some opening. Everywhere I have gone since 1995, I've shared these gifts all over the world, working for major global corporations. Everywhere. I've gone, people have said stop. And they take out their paper and pens and they're writing down the four gifts. And that is whether it's in Singapore or in Lublin, Germany or Canada or Mexico, wherever. And I believe that is because these four gifts are so, they're universal truth. People know that they need this inside of businesses to be able to really care for the people move forward. And then the, of course the profits flow when you do that or whether you're out in your community or your own home, these gifts. So I would say they've been really well received. Uh, in my executive coaching, I always include the gifts. And these leaders are like, really, I'm going to do better if I forgive the unforgivable? And then we start diving into it. And then they start seeing how it's connected into some things that they have created barriers in their own organizations, you know, or hope, hope in action. Okay, so how do you get hope? Well, start dreaming. You know, it's important. Most of these things, these great things we created, or somebody began dreaming them in a garage or at night or something. But these gifts, these four gifts are really well received. They work. And that's why I felt compelled. I, I'm a writer of business reports and designing training. I, I'm new to this author thing. But I was compelled because it was time with everything going on. We need these gifts. They work. This is stunning to hear that it is well received and that you continue to do the work. Well, let's talk a little bit about the current environment. And usually I talk about this as a politics-free zone, but let's see if we can look at some of the challenges and not get too deeply into who's right and who's wrong. Yeah. But I am concerned about the mistreatment of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans the mistreatment of Hispanic Americans and Native Americans. What can we do to correct this on an individual basis? What can we as Americans do to solve this problem? Yeah. 
Well, thank you for asking that. Actually, in all my interviews, this is the first time anyone's asked me that. I'm just like, I could cry, but I won't. <laughs> but it is welling up, I'm seeing. Um, it's to stay just as you are, to stay informed about what's going on. You know, uh, speak out. Speak to your neighbors about what's going on. Speak to your the people you've elected. Um, you know, I still believe in positive action, whatever that is. Some people will go out and march in peaceful march. But if that's not yours, then you use your method. There's many. But it's actually being in positive action. Prayer is always welcome. But it's really important when we, if people only knew all of the contributions Hispanic Latino people have made to this country, I have a book and it has single lines, all these contributions up to 1992. So we did, I don't even have the last few decades. It would just overwhelm you about, you know, in understanding about how blood works, all the different, we have contributed so much and we continue to. So one of the things I love about our country is it does have ideals to live up to. And so if each one of us would really take that to heart, then we would be doing and speaking out, whether it's a Latino, the Hispanics, whatever, Native Americans, but we would speak out and demand that we be informed about what's going on and that we change it. So Standing Rock, I can't help when you say Native American. I was so happy to see so many people come to the fore about Standing Rock and looking at the sacredness of water. That was really important. However, if you look at the news, very little time was given to it. And yet it's critical. So we need to keep looking at the issues that affect all of us rather than just seeing it as the people in the front line because it all impacts. The wall impacts all of us, not just Mexican Americans. The, the water getting polluted affects all of us, not just Native people. It's just that these folks are stepping up and standing there in the front and so we need everyone so thank you for that so that's something that individually you can do collectively of course is to look at what's happening with elections ask people and i don't i'm not talking about um party now whatever party you are whoever is running ask all of them where do you stand on immigration where do you stand on on um uh environment where do you stand on various justice issues ask those questions um, that's really important for us to be discerning and then vote with our heads and our hearts what we know to be right and true. In your book, um, there are references to the four directions. Can you talk about that and how our understanding of our relationship to the earth uh, will grow if we learn more about Native American practices? Well, one of the things I love about indigenous worldview is that it's holistic. It's everything is interconnected. It, there is no illusion of separateness. It's just powerful. So the notion of four directions is basically looking at there are these four directions, the four races of people. And so you have the, the white direction, white people, the yellow direction, Asian people, the red direction, native people, the black direction, the black people. There are also elements that combine with this. Um, so the, it, it's this hoop, the hoop of life, the hoop of oneness is acknowledging not only our interconnectedness, but our uniqueness as well. We need our similarities and our differences. And so when you embrace the hoop of life, the hoop of life understands we, not I. Let me make that clear. The hoop of life understands we, not I, but me is included in we. So people think, oh, then I'm not, I'm gonna lose out if it's, we. no. All of this oneness, these four directions, give us everything that we need. The problem is, is we've gone into a worldview, a mindset that it's I, it's all just about I, and then greed, and then self, and then it spirals into the illusion of separateness. Then we do needless harm, not only to others, but to ourselves as well. So out of this four direction that you put in on means we live a life of abundance. It's all here. We're not alone. We have all of it. So, but to, to now, to put things in right relationship, 
is to hold both together. Is to know, and with, that's why I said, within we is me. The problem is if you go the I, where's the we and I? <laughs> there is no we and I. So it is talking about we need a mind shift. We need a shift to the wisdom of understanding we're part of an interconnected whole. Not losing oneself, but rather gaining and being part of the whole. So let me, one other concept I'd love to share. There's a notion called seven generations. And the idea of this is a leader, as any person, because we lead our own life, not others, is that any decision we're going to make, we look out seven generations and how the impact on them is going to be. Now that's coming from a we notion. But when you start looking at that, it causes you to really think about the decisions you make that look like short term, look like really great gains, very short term, a lot of harm, and then we're dealing with it. So seven generations, and right now many prophecies around the world are talking about we're in the seventh generation. And so we need to be looking at this again and creating that mindset with every decision we make, is it going to do benefit seven generations out or is it going to do harm? We wouldn't be struggling with some of the issues of oceans and, and all the waters and destruction on many levels had we thought that. But it's also not too late. At least the elders I talk to are very much as you and I, all of us have a role to play, but we need to get on with it now. And that wisdom yeah. can be found in the four sacred gifts I think it's a must read for people by Dr. Anita Sanchez. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure, Anita. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Phyllis. Join us for Profunda TV on PrincetonTV.org.